with Gurudev's instructions, then we're reading Bhagavad Gita as a <clears throat> as a as an introduction to bhakti, uh, as an introduction to understanding the place of Radha Mohan throughout time, and not only in the teaching of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and the six Goswamis, who we re we also remember when we're when we're reading. And we're trying to understand the basic idea of the energy of the goddess of Prema, the goddess of divine love, Radha Rani, always present in Krishna's activities and always present in Bhagavad Gita. Um, last time we read from verse 15. And verse 15 talked about what it means to know, what it means to know, to have knowledge of Krishna. And we understood from what we read that having knowledge of Krishna is not like having book knowledge. It's not like having philosophical knowledge or logical knowledge. Krishna is all knowledge. So if we have knowledge of Krishna, we're somehow completely enveloped in a devotional way with the entire universe, because Krishna is all knowledge. So all the activities of our lives are in Krishna, all the experiences we have, and very importantly, all the emotions that we feel. These are all part of the knowledge of Krishna. Those who are in complete Krishna consciousness, we said last week, are those who have knowledge of nothing else but Krishna. They have knowledge of nothing else but the feelings and the activities and the experiences of, of the divine. So verse 15 was a meditation on this idea of knowledge not being a little bit of something that we find in a book <clears throat> or watching a film or learning by talking to someone, but it's the knowledge of God, the knowledge of ourselves as God, our relationship to God, to, to Krishna, to Radha Mohan. And we'll actually come back to that today in the verses from, from verse 20 and onward. There's, we'll see that there's a lot to, to learn about knowledge and what knowledge of divine love is, what the knowledge of prema actually is as well. And then we had <clears throat> the verses 16 through 19, which were very, very special, you remember, very poetic. And they essentially told us what it means that God is everything, what it means that Krishna is everything. And you can just read the verses quickly yourselves if you like, but it was a very special way of saying that that Krishna is not a simple thing, an object of our minds or an object of our knowledge, but Krishna is our minds, Krishna is our souls, Krishna is the love we feel. For example, in 16, says, I am the ritual, I am the sacrifice, I am the ancestors, I am the herbs that heal, I am the chanting, I am the butter, I am the fire. So it's not just the individual things in the world that Krishna is, but Krishna is the world itself. And when we aspire to, to our spiritual form, to our svarup, to our constitutional position, then we're aspiring to integrate completely and fully into this world, to not have any more difference between things in the world and the world. No difference between objects of Krishna's attention and Krishna himself. We'll be completely one. When we're in our spiritual form, we are completely part of Radha Mohan's spiritual form too. So the idea of knowledge, the way we understand it in the West, disappears. We don't say, I have knowledge of the way to the bakery. I have knowledge of the poem by somebody, or I have knowledge of how to fix, uh, I have knowledge of how to fix my car. When we say, I have knowledge in Krishna consciousness, we have knowledge of the way our soul relates to the soul of God. 
And that's knowledge which com com includes all knowledge. So this kind of reflection and the beautiful poetry of the verses from 16 and 17 and 18 and then 19 uh, to describe this kind of experience of full and complete knowledge of Krishna, which means full and complete knowledge of our own spiritual form and complete knowledge of how that spiritual form fits with the spiritual form of Krishna. That was last week. And now this week we'll go on with verse 20, which in some ways talks about knowledge again, but it also talks about the difference be between Vaidhi Bhakti and Raghunuga Bhakti. And it talks about the difference between uh, worshipping God, worshipping Krishna, and knowing Krishna. So let's have a look. <clears throat> there's chapter, there's verse 24. <laughs> The verse says, those who study the Vedas and drink the Soma juice, seeking the heavenly planets, worship me indirectly. Indirectly. They take birth on the planet of Indra, where they enjoy godly delights. Those who study the Vedas and drink the Soma juice, seeking the heavenly planets, worship me indirectly. They take birth on the planet of Indra, where they enjoy godly delights. Um, so the verse is talking about those pious people, Brahmans, who are studying honestly and sincerely, seriously. They're studying the Vedas, they're learning, they're learning the Shastras, they're carrying out the rituals which are prescribed in the Vedas. They're drinking the Soma juice, this is the, the, the nectar, which is uh, the remainder from the ritual, the ritual worship. And they're seeking to rise to the heavenly planets. They're trying to improve their spiritual positions. But Krishna, Krishna says in the verse, they are worshipping me indirectly. What does this mean? This means they're carrying out all the mechanical gestures of worship with sincere hearts. And that's why they will rise to the level of the planet of Indra. Indra is a demigod. So it won't be absolutely to the level of Krishna, but they can improve their spiritual positions. However, they're indirect in the sense they're, that they're not going directly to the heart of the, the, of the matter. The heart of the matter is the devotional love for Krishna. So even the most learned scholars of the Vedas are using philosophy and logic and carrying out mechanically, formally, officially, the different rituals, they will only come to Krishna by a long detour if they don't dedicate themselves to an emotional, devotional, loving, devotee relationship to, to Krishna. <laughs> they have a long path in, ahead of them. And like we've said many times, our Guru, our Guru Dev is taking us on the shorter path by showing us, by immersing us directly in devotional love. Guru Dev is showing us the direct path, what uh, Narama Maharaj calls the hidden path, the one which goes through the heart and not through the formal, official 
mechanical gestures of worship. Once again, these are good things to do. These are positive things to do. They're the right things to do. And once again, if we are doing these things without loving devotion for God, then we will take a long detour in order to, to find our place close to God. Uh, Abhupad yeah. says in the purport, the word Travidya, uh, yes? Radha Gurudev. Radha Gurudev. So nice. So good. Radha. Very nice. Beautiful. Hmm. Um, Trai Vidya, Vidya, sorry, is the three Vidya, the three, three books of the of the of the Vedas. And we remember this word Vidya. We talked about it early in maybe one of the first two lessons. This is knowledge, and it's very important knowledge. But it's practical knowledge. It's knowledge that helps us to live in the world, in the material world. It's knowledge that we can apply to our material lives. And this is what, uh, what the verse is referring to, the kind of ritual no worship based on practical knowledge that the, that the scholars of the Vedas are using. And I can't repeat too much that this is very important and it's very useful, but it's not everything. So Prabhupada says the Trai Vidya refers to the three Vedas, Thamma, Yajur, and Rig. A Brahmana, so a, 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 a high priest of worship who has studied these three Vedas is called a Trivedi. Anyone who is, who is very much attached to knowledge derived from these three Vedas is respected in society. Most of the Vedas, you may, you may know, are very pragmatic. There's lots and lots of detailed shastras about describing what to do in rituals and how to get to which loka we might want to go to how to get to Indra Loka or other places, and all the things we need to carry out in order to get there. So the Vedas are very Vaidhi Bhakti oriented. And only a small part of them are, are, are more oriented towards bhakti, um, Raghunuga Bhakti and what's possible there. So if we're reading and following the Vedas, there's a, great, there's a strong tendency that we'll be doing ritual worship in this way that will only take us to the demigods, that will only take us to, to the middle levels of enlightenment. The, the Vidya, the Trai Vidya, give us fruitive knowledge. Fruitive knowledge. Just like knowledge of how to fix a car helps us to make our car work again. This kind of knowledge, the Vidya from the Vedas, gives us real practical knowledge about how to increase our spiritual position. It's knowledge that has a goal, a uh, fruitive knowledge. It's knowledge that has a, has a product, has a result. And what's important here is that result is different than Krishna. The goal is something different than Krishna. The goal is to come to a higher spiritual level, but not to Krishna. In this case, he talks about going to Indra, one of the demigods, going to Indra Loka. So knowledge that is fruitive, any knowledge that is fruitive, we call that in the West, instrumental knowledge, knowledge that produces a product. Any knowledge like that cannot take us to our spiritual form cannot take us to our Svarup. Cannot Correct. take us. Yeah. Yes? Radha Gurudev. Product means what is the product? Knowledge 
bring to develop the product instrument to me which what is meant okay explain more um which which part explain more good then knowledge 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 to bring to the productive activities that hmm. part hmm. what the product okay product which type of product right in the um, fruit of knowledge is knowledge which has a fruit that means it's knowledge which helps us to create something it has a product it has a result knowledge of how to make bread for the baker let's the baker make a piece of bread it's very important knowledge knowledge of how to grow mangoes results in mango very nice mangoes that we can eat very important but fruit, fruitive knowledge cannot bring us to the divine fruitive knowledge can only result in material fruits knowledge that can lead us wow. to the spiritual form to our spiritual form or to knowledge of the spiritual form of god has no result it's non fruitive there's no results to it loving god has no no result it's pure giving it has no cause and it has no result we just love we just love god it gives us nothing because we already have everything when we're loving god we already are everything when we're loving god yeah <coughs> wow how you get the so deep mm. they like it mm. <laughs> it's my god mm. So here in this verse Krishna is saying all the great priests the vedic priests when they're carrying out the rituals in the vedas that are described in the vedas they're actually fruitive no they're fruitive knowledge there they're doing it with a goal the goal is to come to a higher to indra loka is what he's talking about here come to a higher spiritual level that's very nice but only by having seeking knowledge that has no fruitive goal knowledge of krishna knowledge of god can we come to unity with god and come to knowledge of our own spiritual form so fruitive knowledge always has a target always has a purpose always uh, has a purpose and that purpose is always something different than god it might be to be a better father might be to be a better uh, plumber it might be to reach a higher level of position in in the world but it cannot be to find unity with god it's always wow. it's always finite it's always has a finite character and and god is not finite and love is not finite so the trai vidya that prabhupada is talking that comes in the verse and prabhupada comments too these are all very tactical knowledge practical things we can do to improve our position but they're all done in the material mode they're not in the transcendental mode and they will not carry us beyond the 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 material mode 
even if they're very respected in society, the Brahma are very respected in society, of course, and they carry out very important work, but they remain in the material mode. And even Prabhupada says that attaining Indra Loka is, is in the material mode. Even though it's in the spiritual world, it has a part in the material mode. We're only one foot in the material in the spiritual world and another foot in the material. That it's only by turning ourselves to love, which has no fruit, no, no object. Love, divine love has no fruit, no object. It's only by surrendering to divine love we can be completely in the transcendental spiritual world. So we go on then, Prabhupada says, um, unfortunately, there are many scholars of the Vedas who do not know the ultimate purport of studying them. They don't know why they're studying them, says Prabhupada. Therefore, Krishna here, herein, in this verse, declares himself to be the ultimate goal for the three Vedas. So the three Vedas, that's the, the, Ved the Vedas. So the actual goal, hiding behind the material goals, is Krishna. In this verse, Krishna tells that what the priests, the Brahmas, think they are seeking in the Vedas is not the real goal. The real goal is Krishna. And in this verse, he tells us that. So the ultimate purport of the verse, the, op the ultimate goal of the Vedas, the secret, the hidden knowledge that we talked about so much before, the hidden knowledge in the Vedas is loving devotion of Krishna. Well the ultimate purpose of Vedic rituals is bhakti, says Prabhupada. Loving devotion of Radhamohan. Loving energy, prema shakti of Radharani. So the, even the, the scholars of the Vedas do not see the purport, the meaning of studying them. All they have to do is look into their hearts and they will see what is behind the words and then they will understand. And that is what, Christ, uh, what, um, what Prabhupada says. Actual, right here, actual Trivedis, so actual scholars of the Vedas, they take shelter under the lotus feet of Krishna and engage in pure devotional service to satisfy the Lord, says Prabhupada. So the true Vedic scholars, and there are very few apparently, the true Vedic scholars take shelter under the lotus feet of Krishna and engage in pure devotional service to satisfy the Lord. <laughs> devotional service, Prabhupada continues, begins with the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra and side by side trying to understand Krishna in truth. How do we understand that? Everybody here knows. By association, by trusting in a qualified guru, by carrying out the, the Sankirtan activities, so by the non-scientific ways, by the emotional ways, by the ways of feeling, by the ways of discovering love. This is how we take shelter of the lotus feet of Krishna, and this is how we find the truth behind the words of the Vedas. 
So there are two kinds of Brahmas, there are two kinds of scholars. You have the official ones, the ones that are very carefully doing the Vedic rituals on paper, but not doing them in their hearts. They're going through the motions, if you know this expression. They do the motions with their bodies, but they don't do the motions with their hearts. They enact the rituals, but they don't feel the rituals. These Brahmas are worshipping externally, but not internally. They're worshipping with their bodies, and we want to learn how to worship with our hearts. So we can talk about external Brahmas, and we can talk about internal Brahmas. We can talk about externally uh, respecting the Vedas and internally respecting the Vedas. Just like the devotee washing the floor of the temple with side by side with another devotee, one has a pure heart and the other is just washing the floor. We have a Brahma who's carrying out the Vedic rituals perfectly according to the words, but with nothing in his or her heart. And then we have another Brahma who's carrying them out full of love and devotion to, to Krishna. And they're in com two completely different places on the spiritual, in the spiritual world. So Prabhupada continues, by such endeavor, the, per the worshippers of different demigods are certainly purified of the contamination of the lower qualities of nature and are thereby elevated to the higher planetary system or heavenly planets known as Mahaloka, Janaloka, Tapoloka, etc. Once situated on those higher planetary systems, one can satisfy his senses hundreds of thousand times better than on this planet. So look what Prabhupada is saying here. He's telling us first, people who worship the demigods, who are material, people who worship them, worship them correctly, with respect and, ser and seriousness, they become purified of some of the lower contamination in their souls. And they rise spiritually. They rise to a higher loka, a higher planetary system. But what is the purpose of rising to a higher level? Well, what they find there is that they can satisfy their senses hundreds of thousand times better, their material senses. They can find more and more and more pleasures from that point of view higher in spirituality, but still not knowing Krishna. So it's possible to reach some higher knowledge of God through this path, but without the activities of bhakti, without devotion, without love, without loving service, we cannot find the true knowledge of Krishna. So what is being carried out by many Brahmana is Vaidhi Bhakti. <coughs> the, the, the answer is simple. To reach knowledge of Krishna, we must understand that Krishna, Radha Mohan, is a loving relation. <laughs> a loving relation of Radha and Mohan. And once we know that the kind of knowledge we need is not scientific knowledge, but emotional knowledge, spiritual knowledge, then we can see the soul of Krishna in its own terms. 
It's like going to Portugal and speaking German. You go to the to Krishna and try to communicate with the loving devotional heart of Krishna by using another language, the language of science. This doesn't work. We must learn the language of love to communicate with the God and Goddess of Love, Radha Mohan. So our learning process as devotees in the shelter of Gurudev is learning what love is. Learning what it means to speak the language of God. The language of love, the language of loving devotion. Hmm. That is the path to knowing the inner spiritual nature of, of God and to knowing the inner spiritual nature of ourselves. The spiritual form of Krishna is not technical rituals, it's not science, it's love. But other one is a relation of two in love. Understanding this requires us to understand love. It's both very simple and extremely difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so all ritual must be filled with love. Every meal we eat, every tidying up we do, every clothing we put on must be filled with love to explore every corner of the language of love. Then this experience of, you can say, disappointment by the Vedic scholars, the ones who don't see Krishna as loving relation, and the limit of their pleasure in, in the celestial bodies, that comes back now in this next verse, in verse 21. Krishna continues speaking to Arjuna. When they have thus enjoyed heavenly sense pleasure, they return to this mortal planet again. Thus, through the Vedic principles, they achieve only flickering happiness. Only happiness like a candlelight only for one moment, and then it goes out. Since the ritual worship is fruitive, since it has a concrete goal, since the, they are, they're looking to achieve one thing, and then once there, the job is over, then also the Value, spiritual value, is limited. It has value, but it's limited. Once we achieve that position we want by carrying out the rituals, the value is done. It's like a tank that is emptied out. It's exhausted. It's consumed. There is no more value to it once we arrive. Once we arrive at Indra Loka, for example, then we've arrived and there's nothing more to gain, nothing more, nowhere else to go with our plans of this fruitive action. So there we are with nothing. If our goal, however, is to reach Krishna, and we reach Krishna, then the, then the pleasure is endless, because love is endless. All goal-oriented action is finite. It has an end, except for one, and that's becoming the devotee of Krishna. And that is because if there's one thing in the universe which has no end, it is love. 
All else is finite. Only love is infinite. So once we find ourselves in a position of divine love, we are in a position of endlessness. Love is the one thing in its divine form that has no object. Pure love has no object and no cause. And that love can expand forever and ever. There's only one experience in the world like that, and it's love. Pure love. Not love which has an object, like love for chocolate or love for Hollywood movies. This is a different matter. But prema, divine love, is love that is pure and flowing from nothing to nothing, with no interest, no cause, and no object. And this goes on forever. Here, Prabhupada comments. <clears throat> One who is promoted to those higher planetary systems enjoys a longer duration of life and better facilities for sense enjoyment. Yet, one is not allowed to stay there forever. Once again, it's finite. Anything which is not connected with divine love is finite. It has an end. Just like our material bodies have an end. Anything we accomplish with those material bodies also has an end. So even if you go up to a higher planetary system in the heavenly system, and you spend some time there, maybe a very nice time, it has to come to an end. So there are some advantages to being pious, to have some, having some good pious activities, religious activities. And we can have some enjoyment there, but it's not forever. What happens? Then Prabhupada continues, well, one is again sent back to this earthly planet upon finishing the resultant fruits of pious activities. So we've consumed the fruits of what we created by doing our pious activities. We worked and worked, we did our ritual service, we were good devotees, and we carried out all the, um, all the tasks and all the rituals, and this gained us some advantages into uh, and put us on a higher planetary system. But the pleasures that we get there, they're finite, and we consume them after some time. Prabhupada says, he who has not attained perfection of knowledge, as indicated in the Vedanta Sutra, Janmadi Ashyayata, or in other words, he who fails to understand Krishna, the cause of all causes, becomes baffled in achieving the ultimate goal of life and is thus subjected to the routine of being promoted to the higher planets and then coming down again, as if situated on a Ferris wheel, which sometimes goes up, sometimes goes down. So now Prabhupada is a little bit more explicit about the knowledge that's missing for these people, for these Brahmana. He who has not attained perfection of knowledge. And by what do, we, what do we mean by this again? This means knowledge of love, loving knowledge, not scientific knowledge, but knowledge of the divine loving nature of the divine Svaru, the spiritual form of God, which is, consists of loving relation, Radha Mohan. So one who's not attained this kind of knowledge, perfection of knowledge, one who fails to understand Krishna, then becomes baffled, 
does not understand how he can find the ultimate goal of life, and then goes up and down like a wheel. He does, carries out pious activities like a very sincere and serious devotee, without heart, goes up, con 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 consumes the spiritual capital, if you like, the, the spiritual product, and then goes down again, and around and around. So the process of celestial pleasure, you could say, is circular. It goes round and round. This worship according to only mechanical Vedic principles is not transcendental. It doesn't take us to God. We can rise, but it's not transcendental. Sometime it runs out like the tank in your automobile. And what's more, when we arrive, if we live like this, and we arrive on the higher plane and have more deeper sense experience, this also limits our thinking of divine knowledge, our thinking about Radha Mohan, our thinking about the loving relation, and, and it exposes the limit of, it shows the limit of what we cannot find only by focusing on pleasures. And if you think for us Westerners or anybody in the Abrahamic religions like Christianity or Islam or, or Judaism, heaven is always described as a place where there's pleasure. Heaven is a place, I grew up thinking heaven's a place where there's just ice cream all day long. That's what heaven is. And then hell is this place where it's burning and hot and we're hungry all the time and it's just suffering. This is the kind of low-level spiritual place that the brahmana are coming to with their ritual activities. It's a place where it's just a matter of pleasure or suffering. And when the ice cream is gone, the pleasure, the pleasure is over. And then we have to go back to earth and earn some more privilege to eat some more ice cream. But this is not the transcendental world in our tradition. It's not a place where we just go and find pleasure, or at least not pleasure of the kind we can eat up like ice cream and then it's gone. In transcendental unity with God, we don't, there's no difference between material and spiritual. They're one. The material pleasures are the spiritual pleasures, and the spiritual pleasures are the material pleasures. There's no two parts anymore. They're fused, just like Radha Mohan is the fusion of the enjoyer and the enjoyed. We see in that spiritual condition, that transcendental place, we see no difference between where we are in the spiritual sense and where we are in the material sense. There's no ice cream there. It's all, it's all endless. It's all an endless satisfaction. There's no feeling that is not also Radha Mohan's feeling. There is no soul that is not also Radha Mohan's soul. There's no Swarup which is not also Radha Mohan's Swarup. Everything, everything that's told about these celestial planets is finite. But what we understand about finding a relationship with Aramon is about pure love with no need for any consumption of objects. The Prabhupada goes on and says, the purport is that instead of being elevated to the spiritual world, where there is no longer possibility of coming down, one simply revolves in the cycle of birth and death on a higher and lower planetary system. So if we'd been elevated to the spiritual world, it would be permanent. We would stay forever. But these Brahman who are focused on only on ritual, they will come down again and go back up again and so forth. 
So Prabhupada says, one should better take to the spiritual world to enjoy eternal life full of bliss and knowledge and never return to this material, miserable material existence. So the traditional Vedic Vaidhi Bhakti approach can only extend the circle of birth and life and only a pure loving devotional approach can end the circle of birth and life, birth and death, I'm sorry. Verse 22. And now we start to see the alternative, the devotional, loving devotional service alternative. So Krishna says, but those who worship me with devotion, meditating on my transcendental form, to them I carry what they lack and preserve what they have. But those who worship me with devotion, meditating on my transcendental form, to them I carry what they lack and preserve what they, what they have. And this is what we do in our devotional service. We worship with devotion and we meditate through studying the Leelas, the, the Vraj Leelas. We meditate on the transcendental form of Radha Mohan. And if we do that, says the verse from Bhagavad Gita, then Krishna will give back to us what we need, what we lack, and preserve what we have. There's a very beautiful word, word in the verse, which is a bit lost in the translation. It's nitya biyuktamam. And then you can divide it up into parts, nitya biyuktamam. Nitya means et eternal, forever. Abhi, action, yukta, you know this word, it's like yoga, union, or linking together. And anam, anam means with, with me. So when he says, worship me with devotion, he's saying, carry out eternal action of union with me. Yukta anam, union with me. And this is what is necessary to find, to find my, my, my transcendental form. So in this verse, Krishna really goes directly to the point. It's through bhakti that we can find the, the, the transcendental reality. Mm. The verse is wonderful, Gurudev, just wonderful. I got from the begun by you this time to our heart. Hmm. So, you have a realization that hmm. gifts for us. Hmm. This is mercy. This is mercy. Yes. So then Prabhupada comments. He says, one who is one who is unable to live for a moment without Krishna consciousness cannot but think of Krishna twenty-four hours being engaged in devotional service by hearing, chanting, remembering, offering prayers, worshipping, serving the lotus feet of the Lord, rendering services, cultivating friendship, and surrendering fully to the Lord. Wow. Mm -hmm. 
So when we're in this position, we cannot do, we don't want to do anything but these things. And we cannot do anything but these things. 24-7, like Gurudev says, hearing, chanting, remembering, prayers. This is all we want to do. So when we're doing devotional service, time disappears. As you know, when you go to uh, Vrindavan and Munga Mandia, then you go for one month and you stay one day and you have to leave again. It's just the time goes by so fast. We're just engaged all the time in devotional service. So we don't think about 24 hours. We don't watch the clock. We don't think because the time disappears. There is no time. There is just Radhamon. Yeah. There's a place where there's no difference between the mundane material world and the mm. and the spiritual world world we're meditating about. Yeah. We're not looking for anything more. We don't devote our hearts to anything more. We don't have to understand anything more because we have everything. And that's really what I suppose self-realization is. That's what realization is. When all these needs stop, when all these needs, these ego-based needs stop to watch the clock, to create material things, to go places, to return. But again, I, I think it's important, and I've tried to say it before, that, that all these things are not far away from us. They're hidden right under the words of the rituals. They're under, under the words of the Veda. And that's partly what we're trying to say by reading the Bhagavad Gita with Gurudev's inspiration, inspiration that you don't have to go to strange places. You look in the everyday books that we use and you find. You find the Radharani mm -hmm. there, the energy there, the love there, the devotion. And of course, Prabhupada helps us a lot because he points these things out to us. But sometimes we can even look further. If we put ourselves in the right state of mind, if we open our minds, we open our hearts, then we see these things in every line of every poem, every song there is. We see that. Um, Prabhupada continues here. If we're focused in that way, then his only desire, the desire of the devotee, is to achieve the association of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This is called yoga. So again, this beautiful word, word nitya biyuktanam. So eternal spiritual union with God. Nitya biyuktanam. And Prabhupada continues again, by the mercy of the Lord, such a devotee never comes back to his material condition of life. Krishna refers to the merciful protection of the Lord. So, in other words, Krishna means the Lord's protection. But what does that mean that the Lord protects us? What does this mean? Let's meditate a minute on this. That means, I think, that the love is flowing in such a way that we are held in our spiritual reality. We are held in our spiritual form by the power of love. The Lord is not helping us by giving us money or, or giving us a job or giving us a new house. The Lord is helping us by letting the love flow in a way that holds us in 
like the like the powerful current of a river holds us into the spiritual our own spiritual form our own svarup and, and keeps us gently in our constitutional position solidly and interrupted i'm sorry uninterrupted solidly and uninterrupted so it's not like a it's not like a shield of an army it's not a protection against violence or danger in a way it's a protection against our own ego this loving protection of the lord it's a helping hand that helps that lets us focus when focusing is difficult it's a it's the release of loving the lord's love in our hearts so that we can be motivated to stay focused on our group <laughs> let's remember <clears throat> let's remember that mahaprabhu is loving relation itself krishna in loving relation it's the yuga la kishor so protection means it means living that same yugala kishor relation in our lives it means loving relation incarnated in our lives it means practicing that loving relation so the protection of god is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's appearance is already protection because it inspires us to stay in the love. It inspires us to stay in the flow. It gives us strength to love, not strength to to fight or defend ourselves somehow against attack. It's not protection like this. Knowledge of the loving relation of Radha Mohan gives us strength and an example and an inspiration to keep our hearts pure to to copy that divine love we'll never get there we're, we're always imperfect but um, but it will inspire us to to try to to go there and it and by serving guru by serving guru manjari we are also serving divine love we were helping we are helping radha mohan in return radha mohan protects us and we help the loving relation by supporting our guru our guru manjari who's also supporting as rupa manjari the loving relation whatever love you give to me says krishna remember that one gurudev says it often whatever love you give to me i give you back in kind Whatever love that we give to Radha Mohan through through our service in Manjari Bhav and through our service to Guru in Guru uh, Manjari as Guru Manjari, that love will come back to us, and it comes back to us through the love of Guru Guru Dev. We all know this. So the last the last line from Prabhupada here in the purport is. The Lord helps the, the devotee to achieve Krishna consciousness by yoga, by union, and when he becomes fully Krishna conscious, the Lord Krishna him, him, um, 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 sorry, the Lord protects him from falling down to a miserable conditioned life. So again, through through Krishna consciousness, we be, we we become closer. To Radha Mohan, we become closer to that loving relation. We learn from it. We're inspired by it, and that love in our own relations will keep us clear and keep us from from falling from falling down ourselves. When we have love for Krishna, Krishna helps us. And here, Krishna means, as Prabhupada said, Krishna means preservation, preservation of loving relation. Preservation of our of our spiritual selves, our svarup. Madhavan helps us by 
cultivating our Swarup, by showing us the path, by inspiring our Guru Dev to show us the path to our own spiritual uh, identity. How else do we jivas know the way to our Swarup? How do we any ji? How does any jiva know how to come to Swarup? So the power, most powerful, the most powerful means for Krishna to help his devotees is simply to reveal the truth of devotional love, and that is what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did. So Mahaprabhu is the greatest gift of Krishna to us because it's the example of how to live in pure devotional love. To be live in purely in the love that we already possess, but to use it purely and to live it purely. That's what Krishna did. He incarnated as a devotee of the goddess of love, as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Um, verse 23. Whatever a man may sacrifice to other gods, O son of Kunti, is really meant for me alone, but it is offered without true understanding. Whatever a man may sacrifice to other gods, O son of Kunti, is really meant for me alone, but it is offered without true understanding. This is really quite beautiful idea. The sacrifice that's given to Indra in the in the a few verses before, the sacrifice given to Indra and other demigods. The final destination of that sacrifice is actually is actually Krishna, even though the Brahmanas don't know it. Indra, the demigods, are expansions of Krishna. So even when they think they're doing mechanical, technical. Vaidhi service, despite their ignorance, despite that the fact that they don't know what they're doing, that service goes to Krishna. It goes through Indra or the demigods and goes to Krishna. Indeed, when we do, when we do any worship. To anyone, to any demigod, to any god, to any living being, to any man, woman, to any existing being, any worship at all, that love goes to Krishna. Wow. They say, they say in Europe that. All roads lead to Rome. You know this expression, maybe. <laughs> all roads lead to Rome. <laughs> well, in Raj, we say that all love leads to Radharani. There's no love that doesn't come from her, and there's no love that does not return to her. Any place we place yeah. love in the universe, in our cooking and cleaning, in our lover, in our mother, this love finds its way back to Radha Mohan. It's the receptacle of all love. Love your children, you are loving God. So, to put a few weeks ago, we talked about the fools. To put it in terms of the fool. It's not that the fool is wrong. 
It's that the fool does not understand how great a thing he's doing. So the foolish Brahman, they're, they're doing their worshipping to Indra. What they don't realize is that they're actually doing worship to Krishna, because everything returns to Krishna. Let's see. So Prabhupada, the, the purport here is, persons who are engaged in the worship of demigods are not very intelligent. Well, although such worship is done to me indirectly, Krishna says. For example, Prabhupada says, when a man pours water on the leaves and branches of a tree, without pouring water on the root, he does so without sufficient knowledge or without observing regulative principles. So it would be better to pour the water on the roots, but if we pour the water on the top, on the leaves, it will find its way indirectly down to the roots. The same way with our worship. We can uh, do our worship ignorantly to, to Indra, to demigods, but that worship, the love of that worship, will eventually indirectly find its way back to Krishna. Prabhupada continues, similarly, the process of rendering service to different parts of the body is to supply food to the stomach. The demigods are, so to speak, different officers and directors in the government of the Supreme Lord. One has to follow the laws made by the government, not by the officers or directors. Similarly, everyone is to offer his worship to the Supreme Lord only. That will automatically satisfy the different officers and directors of the Lord. The officers and directors are engaged as representatives of the government. And to offer some bribe to the officers and directors is illegal. So ultimately, in the end, those who worship Indra and demigods are following the law of the there's they're following the law of the king. They're following the, the the law of Krishna. Even though they don't know it, even if they're doing it correctly, all that worship energy, the love they give is finding its way back to Krishna because Krishna is the creator of the system in which they worship. The demigods are expansions of Krishna, just like the Brahmana are. Uh, and then the last word of Prabhupada is, this is stated here as avidi purvakam, so uh, uh, improper, improper activity. In other words, Krishna does not approve the unnecessary worship of the demigods. He does not approve, but when it happens, it still leads to a good, a good result. Not the ideal result, but a good result. Now we do one more verse, I think. Verse 24. I am the enjoyer and the only object of sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah, I hope. Those who do not recognize my true transcendental nature fall down. I am the only enjoyer and the only object of sacrifice. Those who do not recognize my true transcendental nature fall down. Yes. 
When he says, I am the only enjoyer, he's not saying to people the way it should be. He's not saying to the brahmana and to us and to others the way that he should be the enjoyer. So you better make him the enjoyer. He's just describing the way it is. We don't have to make him into the enjoyer. He already is the enjoyer. It's only that we do not understand this. The brahmana don't understand this when they're when they're worshiping um, the demigods. So our task is only to understand what that means. Understand how Krishna, the enjoyer, is to be found everywhere in the world. We have to realize that he is the enjoyer and what that means. We don't have to be commanded to treat him that way. We only need to understand that he is that way and then live uh, in, um, in harmony with that. But we don't need to change the world, we as devotees, we as jiv jivas. We don't need to change the world. We just need to understand the world and then live in it correctly. We don't need to be revolutionaries. We only need to, we don't even need to change our essence. Our svarup is already the way it should be. We only need to realize what it is. We spend time, too much time, not knowing who we are. We need to only understand that and we'll find our and we'll find our way. Prabhupada comments then. Here it is clearly stated that there are many types of yatna performances, so ritual performances. Yagna means Vishnu. He says, Prabhupada says, in the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita, it is clearly stated that one should only work for satisfying Yagna or Vishnu. But those who are worshipping demigods like, like Indra simply don't understand. That's what Krishna is telling us. They simply don't understand what they are actually doing. What, that they are actually worshipping Krishna. Just like in so many things in our personal lives, we don't understand what we're doing. We don't understand who we are and where we are in the, in the world and what it means, what we're doing, our day-to-day -day, day -day activities. But we have to remember that, as Krishna says, as Prabhupada says, excuse me, the demigods are expansions of, of Krishna. They're demipotencies. They're already part of Krishna. No. No. So it's only by misunderstanding that, misunderstanding what the world is, what the world means, what we are in the world. It's only by misunderstanding, bad understanding, that we, that we go astray. The hard part is understanding, because the goodness is already in us. The love is already there, but if we don't understand how to use it and express it and build it, then, then, we're, then we're quite lost. It's also good to remember that this impersonal worship of the, that it's done by the brahmanas that Prabhupada criticizes, of course, it can be directed at anything, at anyone. It's impersonal. There's no personal. It doesn't matter who. Or what? But our devotion is personal and it's directed at a personal God. So when we direct it at something impersonal, we're just wasting our time. It's not that the demigods are wrong, it's that we're misunderstanding where they are in relation to, to Krishna. We're, and we're wasting our love, we're wasting our loving energy, that precious, precious loving energy which we should be using on transmitting love to, to God through other people and other and through Guru. So then Prabhupada says, there, the perfection of form of human civilization known as Varnash, Varnashrama, 
dharma is specifically meant for satisfying Vishnu. Therefore, Krishna says in the verse, I am the enjoyer of all sacrifices because I am the supreme master. So any sacrifice, any Vishnu, because we said Yagna is Vishnu, any Vishnu, any sacrifice, in the end comes to Krishna. And Prabhupada finishes and he says, less intelligent per persons, without knowing this fact, worship demigods for temporary benefit. Temporary benefit. And therefore, they fall down to material existence and do not achieve the desire goal of life, spiritual realization. If, however, anyone has any material desire to be fulfilled, he had better pray for it to the Supreme Lord, although that is not pure devotion. And he will thus achieve the desired result. So in other words, pious activity is good, and it is rewarded because it's good in the energy of the universe. And, the, and of course, not everyone is born to be a Raganuga Bhakta. Those who understand Krishna Tattva, the meaning of Krishna, the, the meaning of Krishna, the principles of Krishna, they are realized because they know where their soul is in relation to Krishna. They know who he is and what he is and what they are in the spiritual form. And when realized people, like we want to be, we try to be, when they see Krishna's spiritual form, then they see their own form. They see themselves in God and they see God in themselves. The path to Radha Mohan is the path to us, to our own spiritual form, through our own spiritual form, through our own self. And the love that energi energizes that, that path, our trip on that path, the love which is the only way we'll make it, is the love of Radharani. And so when we, when we seek with Gurudev Manjari Bhav, we're seeking that love of Radharani to help us along the way on our, our, on our own paths. Like asking to have wings so, so that we can fly. The wings that the Radharani gives us to fly. And that will carry us through the air to where we, to where we want to go. Yeah. Jai Shri Ram. More, more, by more. No side of the More and more. Your words are amrita. You must not let the pupils get bored. That's the worst for the teacher. <laughs> you know, so deep, really. you know. Okay, verse 25. Karuna, you see how beautiful. Yes, good. Yes. Thank you. Tandava. Those who worship the demigods will take birth among the demigods. <coughs> yeah, oh. Yeah, oh. <laughs> Those who worship ghosts and spirits will take birth among such beings. Those who worship ancestors go to the ancestors. And those who worship me they will live with me. 
So one can do the same worships, but to different to different beings, to different objects. We can make the same material effort, the same gestures with our hands and bodies, the same rituals, and direct it to different beings and have different results. All worship is good, but in different ways. And this is um, this is related to our gunas, I've read now. Those who worship the gods, they're in the material mode of goodness, the sattva gunas. And those who worship the, the ancestors, they're in the, the mode of passion, the passion, the rajogunas. And those who worship the ghosts and spirits, they're in the material mode, the tamo guna. And Prabhupada says, if anyone has any desire to go to the moon, the sun, or any other planet, one can attain the desired destination by following specific Vedic principles recommended for that purpose. <laughs> so it's like a cookbook in the Vedas. You want a chocolate cake? You may you follow the chocolate cake uh, ritual. And if you want an, uh, if you want a banana cake, you follow the banana cake ritual. <laughs> They're all specified. Wow. All the different kinds of worship are special specified. But devotional service, loving devotion, cannot be specified. There can be, can, there can no there can be no recipe for this, even though it's the most important cake. There is no recipe for it. There cannot be a recipe. If there's a recipe telling us how much, how big, how long, where, to whom, what, when, how, it's not prema, it's not love, it's not devotion. It can only come in an unspecified way from the depth of our heart and soul. The only recipe comes from associating with other devotees, associating with Guru by, by chanting and singing and, and, uh, and, and listening and remembering. There is no recipe for devotional service. There cannot be. It cannot be logical. It, if it were logical, it would, it would die at once. It would be gone. It has to come straight from that loving source in our hearts, which is a reflection of the loving source in Radharani. That's the only path for loving devotion. That's the only rest cookbook. The only cookbook for loving devotion is that one. So the greatest accomplishment we can have as, as devotees is to shape our hearts so that divine love can flow through them. We cannot think that love starts with us. And we cannot think that love ends with us. Love flows through us. And our greatest challenge is to open our hearts so that it can flow. There is nothing worse than the arrogance of saying, I give this love to you or that I receive your love, end of story. It's all a passage. The love is flowing. The love does not belong to us. It flows through us. And the greatest thing we can do is to help it to flow. That is what Manjuri Bhav is. That's what, that's what Manjuri, Guru Manjuri does as well. It's to help the love flow through the devotees, through Radharani, and on to Radhamon. That is the task. That is our that is our method, if you like. Uh, so Prabhupada says these rituals are vividly described in the fruitive activities portion of the Vedas, te technically known as the Darsha Parmamashi. Yeah. 
which recommends a specific worship of demigods situated on different heavenly planets, right? So this is the Vedic cookbook for visiting the, the planets. And Prabhupada goes on, he says, similarly, one can attain the Pita planets by performing a spe specific yagna, a specific ritual. Similarly, one can go to many ghostly planets and become a yaksha, raksha, pishacha. Pia, pis, pisacha worship, worship is called black arts or black magic. So there are many men who practice this black art and they think that it is spiritualism. But such activities are completely materialistic. Similarly, a pure devotee who worships the Supreme Personality of Godhead only achieves the planets of Vaikuntha and Krishna Loka without a doubt. So the point is for Prabhupada that we can choose our cookbook to get the cake we want. Wherever we want to go, we, we choose the, the cake that we want. But the one place where there's no recipe, that's the voyage to Krishna Loka. That's the voyage to Brad, which has no recipe, no instruction book, no GPS navigator, only the loving navigator who is our Gurudev. Hmm. Prabhupada says it's easy to understand. See, it is very easy to understand through this important verse that if by simply worshipping the demigods one can achieve the heavenly planets, or by worshipping the Pita, the the um, um, the, the forefathers that achieve the Pita planets, or by practicing the black arts, achieve the ghostly planets. Why can the pure devotee not achieve the planet of Krishna or Vishnu? What's our answer? Because there's no map. There's no GPS coordinates. It only comes through the loving guidance of a loving guru that we can find our way there. There can be no instruction book. Yeah. Hmm. Unfortunately, Prabhupada says, many people have no information on these sublime planets where Krishna and Vishnu live because they do not know of them, they fall down. Where does this information come from? Does it come from picture books and uh, tourist guides and uh, maps and travel instructions? No. It comes from Guru. It comes from the sharing that we do, our association, our love among each other. This is the description of the planets where Krishna and Vishnu live. It's only there we can, in these loving practices, that we can have some idea of what that, what that would look like and how to, how to get there. Even though it's really not a place, is it? It's a place in our hearts in our souls. Our true voyage is to the purification of our own spiritual form. Knowing Krishna, knowing Krishna Loka, just means knowing oneself. Um, knowing Krishna is knowing Krishna's spiritual makeup and knowing our own as well. But then the last word of uh, Prabhupada is the Krishna consciousness movement is therefore distributing sublime information to the entire human society to the effect that by simply chanting Hare Krishna mantra, one can be perfect in this life and go back home, back to Godhead. So again, not by reading the books, but by chanting. Chanting <laughs> Mahamantra, singing, sharing, associating. This is the navigation to Krishna Loka that we that we see. And there I stop for sure before my voice falls apart entirely. I don't have the energy of uh, 
Jainanda Maharaj. Refrain it. Now an example. Please again repeat it, my dear. Which part of <laughs> it? The last. last. I have something. This yeah. last. The last line. Um, yeah. It's uh, Prabhupada says, the Krishna consciousness movement is therefore distributing sublime information to the entire human society to the effect that by simply chanting the Hare Krishna mantra, one can become perfect in this life and go back home, back to Godhead. But when he's talking about distributing sublime information, he's not talking about all the Krishna consciousness people handing out books. He's talking about the sublime information they transmit through their hearts and their behavior and their singing and their association. This is the roadmap to Krishna consciousness. This is the roadmap to Krishna Loka. It's not one that's written on paper with, with navigational coordinates and a GPS. It's through association. It's through Guru, uh, being close to Guru that we can receive the directions to this, uh, to consciousness, to uh, knowledge of our own uh, spiritual form, and to Krishna, Krishna Loka. So crystal clear. Mm. What are the... Yes, very beautiful. Crystal clear. Mm. Yes, <coughs> I never listen like this. Mm. Me too. Um, but thankful to you. Mm. Right. Jai Shri Radha. Beautiful. Always good. <laughs>